And there's no way we're going to sail around the planet. The confrontation is inevitable. The confrontation that is coming is between Christian fundamentalism and Malta. My question is, who creates the violence in the name of religion so that you can finally end the violence in the name of religion? We are living in very, very serious times. They want the church and the state together to regulate conscience. So this is an appeal to the Protestant world. When you look at your roots, don't give up what others were prepared to die for. Well, this evening we're going to talk about extraordinary events in our time. And before I start, I think I would like to make an appeal to my Protestant brethren out there in the world that we are living in very, very serious times. And I believe that they are complacently walking towards a precipice and don't really take cognizance of the situation as it really is. And uh, we need to look at some of the issues. Because today everybody is in an ecumenical mind. Everybody thinks and believes that everybody is coming together and this will bring about an era of peace. Well, the Bible tells us when they say peace, peace, there will be sudden destruction. Now, what is the issue and why will there be sudden destruction? This is what we have to understand. Because what seems to be so congenial on the outside could just contain the sting of death. And that is what we have to discuss. And I know that people know that I am a Seventh-day Adventist. And they think, because he's a Seventh-day Adventist, he's sitting in that sectarian little group there on the one side, thinking that he's holier, or they are holier than anyone else. No, we are more pathetic than anyone else. Don't get the idea that we are fancy or better than anyone else. But there is one difference. We have been instructed with a particular message of warning. And this warning goes to the whole world and to the Protestant world in particular. So this is an appeal to the Protestant world. Will you look at your roots? Will you look at those issues which made you Protestants in the first place? What was the protest about? Has the protest been resolved after Vatican II? Or has it actually been intensified but nobody sees it because of deception. And that is the question I want to ask my Protestant brethren. I'm of German stock. I still speak the language poorly, but I still speak it. My mother was a Lutheran. And if you think back in history, the price they paid for what they believed and where they are heading now I think it is time that they, in spite of the fact that they think that we might be strange people, look at this, just look at it, and make a decision based on the facts and not on the feelings. The Protestant world today does not believe what the Protestant world used to believe. The Protestant world today has incorporated the doctrines of Rome. They have discarded their doctrines in terms of the Antichrist, Daniel chapter 7, Revelation chapter 13. Everything they stood for, everything they wrote, they have discarded. 
And in the place thereof, they have adopted Jesuit doctrines. Now this should send alarm bells ringing throughout the world. And the evangelical world, to a great degree, has accepted dispensationalism, which is just an expansion of a Jesuit doctrine. It is to take the heat off the very target of the prophecies of the Bible. Now, this year is a fascinating year, 2015, because there will be many events taking place, and many people are very fascinated about the events that will take place this year, and there are many predictions as to massive disasters at the end of this year, be they economical, be they natural disasters. Some even believe that, a, that an asteroid will strike this earth, and there are all kinds of conjectures. Just look at the Bible. Just study the prophecies, and none of us need, need to run to and fro looking for answers, because they've all been provided. They were all understood. But they've been rejected, and therefore, there's this vagueness in the world today. Well, next year has been declared a jubilee of mercy, an extraordinary jubilee of mercy. And uh, we, have to, we have to understand the context in which these people move and how they function. We've discussed many issues around numerology and around how Gnosticism works. These people are steeped in numerology. It is part of the cabal. They will not move without it. And they don't mind if this leaks and people become interested and look at all these dates and expect wonderful things to happen on a specific date here and a specific date there. If they want their calendar, their Kabbalistic calendar, and want to operate according to their calendar, even plan details of destructions and wars and calamities according to their calendar, what is that to God's people? Don't we have the Word of God? Isn't that our information basis? Isn't that what we base our doctrines and our understanding on? Why do we have this shift from the Word of God to an occult agenda, which might be fulfilled to the letter, but wouldn't add one iota to biblical prophecy. So, take cognizance, it's interesting. Let me say, vaguely interesting. To them, it's everything. To me, it's pathetic. Because, well, Sorry, I perhaps shouldn't say it so harshly. But to base your entire life on a number here and a number there, and whether this thing is written this way around or that way around, or whether it is this name or that name, is silliness. God is concerned about character development on this planet, and God is concerned about salvational issues, not whether we get the numbers right. But that doesn't mean that we have to ignore what these people do. It's... It's worthy to look at it, and uh, it can put things into a framework, but we shouldn't be hung up on it. The Holy Year of Mercy, and the way they put it out, this is the official Vatican network, newsvatican.va, news.va, and you can see how, how they portray themselves, the image that they portray. The Pope kneeling there at the confessional and receiving absolution. This is, this is an image that is brought across of a humility and, uh, you know, an ambiance that is created for everybody to say, but this is a holy man. And he's called the Holy Father by the highest people on the planet. Call no one father, says the Bible. That doesn't mean your earthly father. But in terms of spiritual things, we have one Father, and that is our God in heaven, and there's none other than that. Anything else is idolatry. And to call a human being holy is presumption of the highest order. 
Well, here is his bowl, an extraordinary jubilee of mercy, which has been promulgated for next year. Now, let's have a look at this. At times we are called to gaze even more attentively on mercy so that we may become a more effective sign of the Father's action in our lives. For this reason I have proclaimed an extraordinary jubilee of mercy. Now when it comes to jubilees, the Kabbalists become very excited. Their knees start shaking and they get all kinds of emotional feelings as a consequence. And if you have a jubilee of jubilees, well, well that's extraordinary. If you should have a jubilee of jubilee of jubilees, well, then you might just as well have a cadenza, because then there are so many fortuitous Kabbalistic things that come into harmony with each other that you can probably move a planet if you have to. So, this is an extraordinary jubilee of mercy. And if they start saying the word jubilee, then it's always a 50th year of commemoration of something or some event. And they plan everything according to a liturgical calendar. And if it falls then within the ambience of a jubilee, even so much better. So let's see how they think. Extraordinary jubilee of mercy at a special time for the church. A time when the witness of believers might grow stronger and more effective. The holy year, it's a holy year, will open on 8 December 2015. That's the end of this year. Now, just, just a thought. The Pope has the power to declare a holy year. The Pope has the power to declare an extraordinary jubilee. The Pope has the power at such an uh, injunction or any other injunction to declare an indulgence. Now an indulgence, as you all know, is relief from the punishment of sins already forgiven. Now I know I've explained this many times, but it doesn't seem as though Protestants get it. I don't think they get it. What started the Reformation? What was the trigger that started it? Indulgences. Indulgences. Martin Luther says, excuse me, what's going on here? This is not biblical. And uh, it started the whole Reformation as we know it. Martin Luther's theses that he put against the church door, all of them only dealt with indulgences. There was no issue of the other things. He hadn't thought about them, about all the other doctrinal errors. It was only about indulgences. Next, in Catholic thinking, when you have been forgiven your sins, then that's one thing. But you have not been relieved then of the punishment due to those sins. So this is what an indulgence is. And an indulgence is a grace handed to the church. And the Pope can take from the merit of Jesus Christ and all the saints that went before and apply that merit to those who don't deserve it because they have sinned grievously in their lives and thereby give them relief from the punishment due. Now if it were a kind man, I always say, I would give relief every morning and every evening so that no one has to suffer on the other day. But why wait 50 years or 25 years or whatever their cycle is to let people suffer if you have the power to relieve them. The interesting thing is, Jesus does not have the power because apparently he's relinquished it to the church. And in any case, what kind of notion is it to say that you still have to pun be punished for sins already forgiven? Now, let's say I did something wrong and I was grievously nasty to my wife. 
never do anything like that, of course. And I go to her and I say, you know what, I'm terribly sorry. I'm the meanest son of, the, of a gun on the planet. Can you forgive me for what I did to you? And she says, sure, I'll forgive you. And we hug and we make up. And the next thing I get a blow from a cake roller over my head that I stagger. I said, what was that for? I forgave you, but I'm just giving you the punishment due to your sin. How well would that go down with me? It's pathetic. It's a denial of the absolute sufficiency of the forgiveness, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. It is an affront to the God of heaven who paid the price to come down to this earth to pay the price in toto. It is by grace that you are saved. If you have to still suffer the consequences and pay the price, in the afterlife, not here, in the afterlife, when you get to the other side, you can't go to heaven, you must first go to purgatory, which doesn't exist in the Bible anyway, then there's something wrong. Now, why don't Protestants see that? I don't understand this. These people are so blatant. They don't care. They put it on the web. So let's see how far he will go. The Holy Year will open on 8 December 2050, the solemnity of the Immaculate Conception. Again, we have a liturgical date. This liturgical feast day recalls God's action from the very beginning of history of mankind after the sin of Adam and Eve. God did not wish to leave humanity alone in the throes of evil, and so he turned his gaze to Mary. I think I'm, I'm, I'm about to have an apoplectic fit. This is this present Pope writing. Is this ridiculous or is this ridiculous? He looked to his son, because before the foundations of this world was laid, the plan of salvation was already laid. And God honored freedom of choice to such an extent that he chose to take the consequences of wrong choices upon himself rather than let us bear them. Unbelievable grace on the part of God. And they turned to Mary. She wasn't around yet for a couple of thousand years. Some 4,000 years later, she appeared. But it is through her matrix which is her womb, which was declared immaculate before his birth, that he was able to come to this earth. That elevates him above any human being on the planet and requires, therefore, the intercession of intermediaries. This gospel that is being preached by Roman Catholicism is not biblical. It is an affront to God. So they say, holy and immaculate. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That includes Mary. Choosing her to be the mother of man's redeemer. I will have the joy of opening the holy door on the solemnity of the immaculate conception. On that day, the holy door will become a door of mercy through which anyone who enters will experience the love of God who consoles, pardons, and instills hope. Hello, why can't I experience it today? Why have to... Do I have to go to some holy door to experience it? Spend a fortune on nothing. On the following Sunday, the third Sunday of the Advent, and then he goes, and then it'll be at St. John's Lateran, and then it'll be at this one, and it'll be at that one, and then eventually it will spread to all the churches in the world where the bishop decides he wants to declare a holy door, and uh, you better queue up to get to the holy door. I have chosen the date of 8 December because of its rich meaning in the recent history of the church. In fact, I will open the holy door on the 50th anniversary of the closing of the Second Vatican Ecumenical Council. What do we have there? It's called a jubilee. 
So he declares a year, a jubilee of mercy, and within that jubilee of mercy, you have a jubilee. So you have a jubilee of jubilees. Now, Kabbalists will get very excited. The church feels a great need to keep this event alive. We recall the pregnant words of Saint John the 23rd, who just declared him saint. Francis declared him saint. But Paul wrote to the saints in, wherever. Everybody in the church had the title saint. So this is not biblical either. This is, this is well, whatever. You can decide what you want to call it. Opening the council, he indicated the path to follow. And this is what he said. Now the bride of Christ wishes to use the medicine of mercy rather than taking the arms of severity. Excuse me. Excuse me. She's taking up the arms of mercy because her arms of severity in the past didn't work so well. How many people did she murder in the name of severity and in the name of her religion? The Catholic Church, as she holds high the torch of Catholic truth at this ecumenical council, wants to show herself a loving mother to all. Patient, kind, moved by compassion and goodness towards her separated children. Good grief. Blessed Paul the Sixth. You can't call him saint yet, but he's well on the way. Spoke on a similar vein at the closing of the council. Now what did they do at this council? He said, we refer to point out how charity has been the principal religious feature of this council. The old story of the Good Samaritan has been the model of the spirituality of the council. So they're the Good Samaritan. A wave of affection and admiration flowed from the council over the modern world of humanity. Errors were condemned. If I read what happened at the council, I think errors were consummated. Because heathenism was brought into the church. People who were atheists were referred to as Christians who do not know that they are Christians. Anonymous Christianity is what Karl Rana called it. And mysticism was introduced at the highest level. They say Vatican II was a breath of fresh air. I think it was mixed with a fair dose of sulfur. Errors were condemned, indeed, because charity demanded this no less than did truth. But for individuals themselves, there was only admon admonition, respect, and love. It sounds so nice, so sanctimonious, and uh, I don't even want to read it because it's terrible, nauseating. Another point we must stress is this. All this rich teaching is channeled in one direction, the service of mankind. A jubilee also entails the granting of indulgences. So there he goes, and grants an indulgence. This practice will require an even more important meaning in the Holy Year of Mercy. To gain an indulgence is to experience the holiness of the Church, who, bespo who bestows upon all the fruits of Christ's redemption. Now there's the crux of the theology. Protestants, please take note. It is the church that administers the grace, not God. The job that has been assigned solely to Jesus Christ has been usurped, has been taken away, it has been given to, given to others. And they have a broader ecumenism, as we see. There's an aspect of mercy that goes beyond the confines of the church. It relates us to Judaism and Islam both of which consider mercy to be one of God's most important attributes. I trust that this jubilee year celebrating the mercy of God will foster an encounter with these religions and with other noble religious traditions. Everybody must come together. May it open to us even more fervent dialogue so that we might know and understand another better. May it eliminate every form of closed-mindedness and disrespect and drive out every form of violence and discrimination. Now please remember that he already opined, stated, that 
If you criticize another religion, that's an act of violence. Even if you harm no one, even if you hurt no one. My thoughts now turn to the Mother of Mercy. May the sweetness of her countenance watch over us, etc., etc. Beautiful words about her. Our prayer also extends to the saints and the blessed ones who made divine mercy their mission in life. Divine mercy. I think especially of the great apostle of mercy, Saint Faustina Kowalska. May she, who was called to enter the depth of divine mercy, intercede for us. The Bible says there is one advocate, one intercessor between man and God, and that is Christ Jesus. So here they're saying Mary, and they're saying the saint. Now, I'm just interested, I'm, I'm always a little bit curious. Of all the Catholic saints, and there are myriads of them, why choose this one? Why does he lift out St. Faustina Kowalska? What, what cabal could there be in this that would be useful to him? So I went to Catholic Online. Her birth, 1905. Her death, 1938. So how old was she when she died? 33. Is that an interesting cabal? Yes, particularly since how old was Jesus when he died? 33. Right? So here's an interesting cabal. And uh, her life, in imitation of Christ, was to be a sacrifice, a life lived for others. At the Divine Lord's request, she willingly offered her personal sufferings in, unity, in union with him, to atone for the sins of others. Excuse me. Excuse me. Protestant world, will you please wake up before you fall off the edge of the precipice? Vatican II changed Rome, they tell me. Vatican II changed nothing. Nothing. The serpent doesn't change. It never changes you are still to receive atonement through the lives of human beings. Now, they made this person a saint. Why? Because it suited them. She had the right age, she had the right cabal, nobody even knew what she did. If she was still a Mother Teresa that went around picking up people and, and doing whatever Mother Teresa did, maybe, yes. Her special devotion to Mary Immaculate and to the sacraments of Eucharist, both of which are false doctrines, and reconciliation gave her the strength to bear all her sufferings as an offering to God on behalf of the Church and those in special need, especially great sinners and the dying. Unbelievable. This is the Pope's encyclical. I have not heard one little peep from the Protestant world analyzing this, saying there's something wrong. In another message, this is now from the book Queen of All, and this book is not in favor of Marian apparitions, but it's not a bad study of what has been done and what has been said in the name thereof. There are still Protestants out there who haven't lost it. God's people are still out there. They might think we are peculiar because we keep the Sabbath of the Lord. But they can just ask Rome, who introduced the Sunday. And Rome will tell them that it was them and that the Council of Trent, they clearly told them that they are not adhering to sola scriptura, but are obeying the Roman Catholic Church by keeping the Sunday. So how do they want to combine all of these things and all of these religions? Queen of all. In another message, Mary told the seers, tell the priests, tell everyone, that it is you who are divided on earth. The Muslims and the Orthodox, for the same reason as Catholics, are equal before my son and I. You are all my children. Hmm. Fascinating. So now, 
what does the Roman Catholic Church and some of its theologians teach on this issue? Ecumenical movement towards Rome. This is the same book. How far along is the Queen of Heaven reunification plan? Is the Pope, whom she guides, currently active in drawing all Christians under the Roman Catholic Church? The Queen proclaims that there will come a time when all of Christendom will be reunified under the Roman Church. Is the Pope working towards that? Yes, yes of course. Are we seeing this? The ecumenical movement, etc., etc., etc. Yes, he's working on it. Pope Pius made this remarkable prediction in 1878 concerning Mary's role to establish the world under her church, the Roman Catholic Church. We expect that the Immaculate Virgin and Mother of God, Mary, through her most powerful intercession, will bring it about that our Holy Mother, the Catholic Church, will gain in influence from day to day amongst all nations and in all places, prosper and rule from ocean to ocean, and from the great stream to the ends of the earth, that she will enjoy peace and liberty, and there will be then one fold and one shepherd. Now, you don't have to be a Pope Pius in order to know that. All you have to do is read Revelation 13, and you will see it will be so. So this is not a prediction of any value. It doesn't make this person a prophet, because the Bible says the whole world wandered after the beast. The wound would be restored. She would regain this power. But he's just saying it will be from ocean to ocean. Now, one interesting man in Catholicism was the late Archbishop Fulton Sheen, who reached millions of viewers through his television broadcasts. And in Sheen's book, The World's First Love, Mary, Mother of God, excuse me, can you be the mother of God? No, you can be the mother of Jesus because he became fully man, but you can never be the mother of God. This is arrogance of the highest order. He comes to some startling conclusions concerning the future of Islam. In his chapter entitled Mary and the Muslims, he says, At the present time, the hatred of the Muslim countries against the West is becoming a hatred against Christianity itself. Interesting. Although the states, statesmen have not yet taken it into account, there is still grave danger that the temporal power of Islam may return and with it the menace that it may shake off a West that has ceased to be Christian and affirm itself as a great anti-Christian world power. Are there such moves in the world today? Now, I just have a very uh, devious mind, <laughs> suspicious mind. What if you control history in any case? Can you not bring this about? Can you not achieve this through your machinations and manipulations? Is this not possible? It's not difficult if you contain, have all power in your hand to predict what you're going to do next. However, then he says, it is our firm belief that the fears some entertain concerning the Muslims are not realized, but that Islam instead will eventually be converted to Christianity. Now, I have no problem with that statement of uh, the dear bishop, because I've made some statements regarding this issue in the past, and uh, Islam has the same veneration for Mary as has Catholicism. Islam teaches that she is immaculate. Islam teaches she will be the highest woman in heaven. And why is this town called Fatima in any case? Why is it named after... Mohammed's favorite female entity. And why is she less, Fatima less, in heaven than Mary? Uh, and why did the Roman Catholic Church say that the Quran is very, very similar to the Gospel of Mary, which is an apocryphal book? And in a way that even some of our missionaries never suspected. It is our belief that this will happen not through the direct teaching of Christianity, but through a summoning of the Muslims to a veneration of the Mother of God. Now, I've seen myself with my own eyes how the Muslims venerate Mary. If you go to the Marian shrines in the Middle East, there are Muslims 
almost more than Christians, hanging up little letters to Mary, etc. This is an interesting thing. So this is what they must do. And he says, uh, they must preach Our Lady of Fatima. So Fatima will play an important part. Now, what is also interesting, that the 33-degree Freemason, Robert Schuller, who is more interested in uh, his own attributes and self-esteem, according to all his writings, which he gets from other 33 Freemason authors, by the way, uh, would have this man, Fulton Sheen, as his absolute role model. Dr. Robert Schuller said of Sheen, I consider Fulton Sheen to be the brightest, most brilliant, the most beautiful Christian in mind and heart that I have known in the 20th century. No one inspired me more, etc., etc. And he had a full-size statue of him made and put in his Crystal Palace church. There's a message here. These people are all working together. I don't believe for one moment that Robert Schuller with the theology that he's taught throughout the years, which negates the work of the Holy Spirit, is a Protestant in heart and mind at all. So, interesting points. Now, 2017. We've moved from 2016, which is a jubilee year, which contains a jubilee of remembrance. And we have all kinds of things where the Pope says, he wants the Muslims and he wants the Jews to accept this mercy as well. So he's basically saying what Fulton Sheen said, just in different words. Now let's move to 2017. This is the year of Jubilees. Pope at charismatic rally in stadium invites them to Vatican in 2017. He also said Catholic charismatics have a special role to play in healing divisions amongst Christians by exercising spiritual ecumenism, whatever that means, or praying with members of other Christian churches and communities who share a belief in Jesus as Lord and Savior. Finally, the Pope invited the crowd, which included charismatics from 55 countries, to come to St. Peter's Square for Pentecost in 2017 to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the movement. There again we have a what? A jubilee. I expect all of you charismatics from around the world to celebrate your great jubilee with the Pope at Pentecost 2017 in St. Peter's Square. So now, 2017 is the next liturgy that is coming along. Now here, if we can have another jubilee superimposed upon this jubilee and a jubilee within a jubilee, or a jubilee within a jubilee, over a jubilee, under a jubilee, that would just blow them all away. So let's look at it. Towards the Catholic Charismatic Reunion or Golden Jubilee. So here they're talking about what it's all about. All their documents are out. This is a big deal. They are working towards it. And then 2017, the hundredth anniversary of the apparition of Our Lady of Fatima. In 2017. So now you have a double whammy jubilee here because it's a hundred years. That's two jubilees. Plus you have the charismatic jubilee. Now, they started the Charismatics in 1967 with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at the Duquesne University, where they all started speaking in tongues, and when Pope Paul himself spoke in tongues. So that's one jubilee, and it ends, or it ends in 2017. Now you have superimposed the Fatima double jubilee. And the Pope has already said that it is his wish to go to Fatima for this jubilee. So this is an important jubilee. It's going to send a very special message. But now, what if we can have some more jubilees? The other group he wanted to reach was the Jews, wasn't it? So Fatima, as they have already said, is specially uh, fenced off, as it were, through the very name Fatima for the Muslims. Now, here's another interesting one. The prophecy of Rabbi Judah ben Samuel. And uh, he was a top Talmudic scholar in Germany. And 
he died around about 1217, so that's a long time ago. And he described all the cycles of Jubilees. And it all came to fruition exactly as he described it. And we're all supposed to be incredibly impressed. But if you are a Kabbalist, you know that you can make it happen on that date because you plan it to happen on that date. And this is exactly how they work. So it's useful to know what they are planning. It's useful to know what they are doing. But I'm not date orientated. I don't care what they are doing. I don't care if they decide to make island Kapita disappear under the ocean on a particular date and then say, look, island so-and-so disappeared on a particular date. It's not relevant. If they were to make the whole Vatican disappear on a certain date, I would be thoroughly shaken in my, my prophetic convictions. Because the Bible tells me exactly what is going to happen. So I'm not going to make these dates important. They're not prominent even to me. Okay, so what is he talking about the eight jubilees of 50s and how they all work and the 1967 wars and all of this? This is his prophecy. Starting in 2012, he talks about 300 years and the Turks take control of Jerusalem. Worked out exactly. Then 400 jubilee years and the rule of the Ottoman, the Turks lose Jerusalem. And then one jubilee, 50 and 1967, six-day war, another jubilee, Israel control to the end time, 2017, the day of the Lord. So they are saying 2017 is the day of the Lord. This is interesting. And of course, as you can see, every single one of these worked out exactly in his jubilee cycles. And uh, wonderful. So 2017 is the day of the Lord. I'm not interested whether it's 2017, 2016, or 2045. I'm watching events. The Bible says the mark of the beast will be implemented. And then there will be no buying and selling. Then there will be a death decree. And then the close of probation will come. And you will only know that it has come because the plagues will start falling. That's what the Bible says. Now I get letters from all over the world, but the plagues have started to fall. Excuse me, there might be drops, but how can the plagues start falling if the prophetic events are not in place? We have a more sure word of prophecy. Now, to get it even more interesting, this is a Catholic book, Boiling Point 2017. Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth, an end-time prediction. Most people are unaware that they are in the most violent war of all times, and the number of casualties, please note, will be in the billions. In the billions. The pit of hell has been opened, and demons have been gathering in souls for damnation. Loss of faith in God has allowed these demons to come upon the earth. And it is possible that the world will soon experience the great tribulation spoken of in the Bible. Few will survive these apocalyptic end times. Well, now I'm, I'm beginning to look up at, to what these people are saying. 2017, a special charismatic jubilee. 2017. Uh, Fatima, double whammy, Jubilee. And now we have this 2017 prediction, none of which I am concerned about or believe or get excited about. I'm just mentioning them, what they are saying. But now I am really getting interested. Because this comes from the Lutherans themselves, Perspectives for the Reformation Jubilee, 2017. Martin Luther, 2017. This is the Protestant world speaking. The religious world presents profound changes. Western societies move in the direction of multicultural and multi-religious relationships. If they are not already shaped by them, 
in this setting the insights that have grown as a result of working out differences and in the give and take of the Christian confessions should be constructively applied in the present. In the face of the plurality of religious persuasions and worldviews, a sense grows for that which is shared by all Christians. At the same time, each respective profile retains its particular significance. From the global, total perspective of the one Christendom, a longing is expressed to have a culturally, but also religiously identified and identifiable home. This is very interesting. It is not inconceivable that the religious world can explode in turmoil, as the stage has been set. And people are afraid of the influx of this religion and that religion and the other religion to the point where, you know, in Europe they're showing pictures of, uh, they're very striking, bathing fashion in the year 2000 and whatever, 17, 18 or whatever. And then it's a, a lady dressed with a burqa totally black, with just the eyes sticking out. And, they are creating fear for all of the issues. Sharia law, and it's, it's incredible what they are all doing. People are longing to get back to, to some, some route where they can ensconce themselves. It doesn't matter how they are doing it or what they're doing. Just look at prophecy. These are just winds pushing people into mind direction. So, you want an identifiable home. 2008, in an inter interview with a, journal, a journalist, Emil Hakkenens, the Jesuit professor, Edward Kimmen, and he was then the General Secretary of the Netherlands Bishops' Conference, said the following, There remains hardly any reason to remain a Protestant. And then he said, I... He sees Protestantism as an action group that forgot to dissolve itself. That's pretty bold words by this Jesuit. And then he said that had not recognized the significance of a global visible leadership personality such as that of the Pope. And then he said, moreover, he stated that he doubted that the Reformation would still exist after 2017. Now, this is a Jesuit speaking. Now, when a Jesuit starts using dates, specific dates, then my ears perk up. So now I'm getting all these 2017s, all these ducks in a row, and I'm not interested about the date. I'm interested in what is planned for that date. There's a difference. There's a big difference. And that they should return to the Mother Church. Religious news services report that the two sides, this is Lutherans and Roman Catholic Church. Now, I want you to remember this. When they had in Seoul the signing of the Unity of Religion Agreement, the Lutherans weren't there. The Evangelicals weren't really there. But who started the Reformation in its form that it is now? I mean, Johann Hus started it, yes, but who actually broke away and finally succeeded to separate from Rome? Wasn't it the Lutherans? Wasn't it Martin Luther? So symbolically, how important would it be if the Lutherans went back? It would be a major deal. So they've decided that they will bury the hatchet. Oh, interesting. And they brought out a joint document from conflict to communion. And they brought that out in June 2013. And they write, There's little purpose in dredging up centuries-old conflict. In the document, the two churches recognize that in the age of ecumenism and globalization, the celebration requires a new approach, focusing on a reciprocal admission of guilt and on highlighting the progress made by Lutheran-Catholic dialogue in the past 50 years. Progress that has been made. Hmm. In the past how many years? 50. 50. Do, you, do you recognize something here? 
there's another jubilee hidden in the jubilee of the 500 years. So there's a jubilee within a jubilee. The fact that the struggle for this truth in the 16th century led to the loss of unity in the Western Christendom belongs to the, I'm going to choke, but I'm going to read it, dark pages of church history. I thought the dark ages ended when light finally shone upon the Word of God. And in 2017, we must confess openly that we have been guilty before Christ of damaging the unity of the church. Now, this is astounding. A document from conflict to communion. But before I get there, let me read you a quote from this marvelous book called The Great Controversy. And I want to encourage my Protestant brethren out there in the world, please read the book The Great Controversy. Read it from cover to cover and don't stop reading it until you've finished it. She writes, Popery is just what prophecy declared she would be. The apostasy of the latter times. 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 and 4. It is a part of her policy to assume the character which will best accomplish her purpose. But beneath the variable appearance of the chameleon, she conceals the invariable venom of the serpent. We are not bound to keep faith and promises to heretics, she declares. So she's quite willing to lie. Hmm. Shall this power, whose record for a thousand years is written in the blood of the saints, be now acknowledged as a part of the Church of Christ? That's a powerful statement. So according to this statement, Rome does not change. But she will assume the character of the chameleon to hide her purposes. I love this little chameleon here in this picture because it's clutching its little lead, says, they're mine, while it looks around. It so beautifully depicts this character. We read on, it is not without reason that the claim has been put forth in Protestant countries that Catholicism differs less widely from Protestantism than in former times. There has been a change, but the change is not in the papacy. Catholicism indeed resembles much of the Protestantism that now exists. Why? Because Protestantism has so greatly degenerated since the days of the Reformers. Now, my dear Protestant brethren, don't get upset. Take a look at the situation, candidly. Look at the documentation. See where you were, see where you are now, and see whether the statement is a, the truth or whether it is a distortion of the truth. Check it out for yourselves. Test the spirit. As the Protestant churches have been seeking the favor of the world, false charity has blinded their eyes. They do not see, but that it is right to believe good of all evil, and as the inevitable result, they will finally believe evil of all good. Instead of standing in defense of the faith once delivered to the saints, they are now, as it were, apologizing to Rome for their uncharitable opinion of her, begging pardon for their bigotry. Now, people don't like these words, but they are truth. Now, Protestant brethren, what if we can show you in your own writings that this is the truth and not, not a conjecture? And this is written more than 120 years ago. And if it happens to be so, will you not lighten up and wake up and look at where you're heading? So I made it my business to go through this document. Why? Because they invite me to do so. From conflict to communion, this is the official document that declares the position of the Lutheran Church and the Roman Church and as to the position they must take in 2017 at the Great Jubilee, which happens to be on the 31st of October 2017. What are they going to do? They have set a date. 
not me, they have set a date. A jubilee upon a jubilee, within a jubilee, over a jubilee, under a jubilee, etc. From conflict to communion, the Lutheran Roman Catholic Commission on Unity invites all Christians to study its report open-mindedly. I call myself a Christian, therefore I have been invited to study this document. And so have all of you, and all of you Lutherans, and all of you Methodists, and all of you Baptists, and all of you Evangelicals, and all of you Calvinists, study this document and see whether Rome changed in, nine, in, in Vatican II, in the 60s, or whether Protestantism has changed. And to walk along the path towards full, visible unity of the church. So we're going to take some pains, and it might seem tedious to some that we will take these pains, but I believe it is essential that the Protestant world be shown pertinently from their own document where they stand in the stream of time. So let us go through this document. We won't get through it all, and we will complete it in a second lecture and then summarize the events and where this is heading. Because I'm not saying the end of the world is coming in 2017. I'm saying they're coming together in 2017. Not because I say so, because they say so. The fact that the struggle for this truth in the 16th century led to a loss of unity in the Western Christendom belongs to the dark pages of church history. This is them writing. In 2017, we must confess, confess openly that we have been guilty before Christ of damaging the unity of the church. So if in 2017 they want to confess guilt for the Reformation, then they will be in 2017 denying the fact that the Holy Spirit was in the movement. Am I correct or incorrect in this conjecture? Okay. This commemorative year presents us with two challenges, purification and healing of memories, and the restoration of Christian unity. Can two walk together lest they agree? Can light and darkness have anything in common? Can those who reject the mediation of, and the individual personal mediation of Christ and the atonement walk together with those who accept it? The following text describes a way from conflict to communion, a way whose goal we have not yet reached. Nevertheless, the Lutheran Roman Catholic Commission on Unity has taken seriously the words of Pope John the Twenty-Third: The things that unite us are greater than those that divide us. What unites us and what divides us? I'm very interested to see how they put this document together. The year 2017 will see the first centennial commemoration of the Reformation to take place during the Ecumenical Age. Now note carefully, it will also mark 50 years of Lutheran Roman Catholic dialogue. What do we have here? We have a jubilee within their 500-year jubilee. So, this is not coincidental. This is deliberate. They plan the date exactly when they will start it. They probably started weeks in advance, but this is the date that they put forward so that it looks to be a jubilee of, of jubilees by divine intervention. This is human devising, devious human devising. Okay? As part of the ecumenical movement, praying together, worshipping together, serving their communities together, have enriched Catholics and Lutherans. They also face political, social, economic challenges. We know all of those things. Lutherans and Catholics have been able to reinterpret their theological traditions. This looks like a, a mutual thing. You give a little, I'll give a little, doesn't it? But didn't we just read in the great controversy that they will never change? Who will change? Protestantism will change. 
I want to see who changes here. Okay. So we have been able to reinterpret their theological traditions and practices, recognizing the influences they've had on each other. Therefore, they long to commemorate 2017 together, no longer separate. This is a choice that has been made by the Lutherans. Now, I want to know, Rome, how have you changed? And what have you changed? For more than a hundred years, Pentecostal and other charismatic movements have been very widespread across the globe. These powerful movements have put forward new emphases that have made many of the old confessional controversies seem obsolete. What a powerful statement. In other words, what the charismatic movement does, it puts religion on the level of the emotion and the feeling and the gifts and the manifestation of gifts. Whereas the Word of God is no longer the standard and the norm and the principle for what is right and what is wrong. If you have the Spirit and I have the Spirit, we're brothers. Whether you keep the Sabbath or the, you keep the Sunday or the Monday or the Tuesday, doesn't make any difference. Whether you believe this or that or the other, doesn't make any difference. The Spirit has made us one. Now, excuse me, shamans also have the outpouring of the Spirit, and they speak in tongues, and Hindu rituals have outpourings in tongues, and voodoo rituals have outpouring in tongues. That doesn't make them necessarily from God, because the Bible says, test the spirits. Now, the Pentecostal movement is present in many other churches in form of charismatic movement, creating new commonalities and communities across confessional boundaries. Hmm. And they will play a significant role in the observance of the Reformation. Interesting. What happened in the past, I want you to listen to this wording. It's brilliant. What happened in the past cannot be changed. But what is remembered of the past and how it is remembered can. Hmm. With the passage of time, indeed change, and it can change. Remembrance makes the past present. While the past itself is unalterable, the presence of the past in the present is alterable. Spoken like a serpent. In view of 2017, the point is not to tell a different history, but to tell that history differently. Now, I call this Jesuit rhetoric. This is Jesuit rhetoric. This is deceiving to achieve an end result. History records so this history which is written in the blood of the saints be discarded? Did all those people die at the stake for nothing? Did they go to their death singing rather than giving up the doctrines which they believe? 20th century Catholic research on Luther, built upon a Catholic interest in Reformation history that awakened in the second half of the 19th century. These theologians followed the efforts of the Catholic population in Protestant-dominated German Empire to free themselves of one-sided anti-Roman Protestant historiography. The breakthrough for Catholic scholarship came with the thesis that Luther overcame with him in himself a Catholicism that was not fully Catholic. That's very clever. In other words, what they are saying is, Luther did not fully understand Catholicism, and therefore he split. No, Luther fully understood Catholicism, and therefore he split. He didn't split because he didn't understand it. The crisis in Catholicism made Luther's religious protest quite convincing to some. This is very negative language. Now, please, this is a joint document published by the Lutherans themselves, asking us to investigate what they are saying. 
So this sets the stage. Now I already have a feel for what is coming. I already have a feel. The dialogue partners are committed to the doctrine of the respective churches, which according to their own conviction express the truth of the faith. So all right, stick to your doctrines. The doctrines dem demonstrate great commonalities, but may differ or even be opposed in their formulation. Well put. So it's really the way you put it which makes the difference, not the doctrine itself. Because of the former, dialogue is possible. Because of the latter, dialogue is necessary. However, yeah, they say it, what appears to be an opposition in expression is not always an opposition in substance. So what are they saying? My dear Martin Luther, you didn't understand us as Catholics, therefore you got it wrong. And whatever you said might have been convincing to some but seeing that we are dealing with more sensible Lutherans now, let's uh, re-investigate and see how we can put something so that we can all sit around the same table. This, this is what they're saying. Am I misreading it? I don't think so. When Luther did not see a biblical basis in Rome's statements, or thought that they even contradicted the biblical message, he began to think of the Pope as the Antichrist. By this admittedly shocking accusation, Luther meant that the Pope did not allow Christ to say what Christ wanted to say and that the Pope had put himself above the Bible rather than submitting to its authority. The Pope claimed that his office was instituted by divine right, while Luther could not find biblical evidence for this claim. He doesn't say it's not true, they say Luther couldn't find the evidence. In response, Emperor v, the fifth, Charles V delivered a remarkable speech in which he set forth his intentions. The emperor noted that he had descended from a long line of sovereigns who had always considered it their duty to defend the Catholic faith for salvation of souls and that he had the same duty. The emperor argued that a single friar erred when his opinion was in opposition to all of Christianity for the last thousand years. So what is the idea that they're planting into the head of the reader already? Where lies the fault? It lies with the Protestants. But still, we haven't discussed the doctrines yet. I want to know what they decide on the doctrines, because this is pivotal. What led to the Reformation if it has indeed changed in Catholic thinking, then I will say there was a breath of fresh air in Vatican II, as some of my own theologians have told me personally. But if Rome has not changed, and Lutherism has capitulated in terms of its doctrines, then there was no breath of fresh air, but a waft of sulfur. Let's look. By grace alone. Together, Catholics and Lutherans confess, and then they quote the joint declaration on justification. By grace alone, in faith in Christ's saving works, and not because of any merit on our part, we are accepted by God and receive the Holy Spirit, who renews our hearts while equipping and calling us to good works. That's their joint declaration and it's published in a separate document, and I've already dealt with it verse by verse in great detail in a previous lecture. So you can look at that lecture. I'm not going to go into the details of that again. No point in repeating it all. Suffice to say, this is not justification. It's nowhere near justification. Because it says, by grace alone, in faith, in Christ's saving work, not by his atonement. I am saved by grace because of the blood that was shed on Calvary. I am saved through the blood of the Lamb. Adam was saved by the blood of the Lamb. Eve was saved by the blood of the Lamb. Everybody who has ever accepted Christ as his Savior has been saved by the blood of the Lamb. This is works. 
Because Catholicism teaches that Christ need not have died for you. But the Bible teaches that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. So the two doctrines are separated. And then it says, and not because of any merit on our part, we are accepted by God and receive the Holy Spirit who renews our heart while equipping and calling us to good works. That's not justification, that's sanctification. So here they intermingle in their doctrine on justification, sanctification and justification, and they make it by works rather than by atonement. It is a serpentile statement, brilliantly construed as it can only be in the mind of a Jesuit. Luther understood the sacrament of the Lord's Supper as a testamentum, the promise of someone who is about to die, as is evident from the Latin version of the words of institution. At first, Luther perceived Christ's promise, testamentum, as a promise of grace and forgiveness of sins, but in the debate with Swingley, he emphasized his belief that Christ gives himself his body and blood that are really present. Faith does not make Christ present. Well put. Well put. Because Martin Luther indeed, in the beginning of his ministry, was absolutely still involved with heart, mind and soul in the Catholic doctrine of the Mass. And Martin Luther in the beginning of his ministry thought that transubstantiation that God really was present in the Mass was a reality. That's how you grow up as a Catholic. I remember myself kneeling before this way for God and asking for intercession. That's what you are trained in. It's hard to give it up. And Martin Luther later changed his view somewhat, but still retained the idea that there was a literal presence. Swingley, of course, was already on the complete Protestant side where he said no it is only a symbol so what do they quote here Martin Luther at the end of his ministry or Martin Luther at the beginning of his ministry sure because it suits them we have to be very careful here and my Lutheran brethren I want you to understand this don't give up what others were prepared to die for he emphasized his belief that Christ gives himself his body and blood that are really present, faith does not make Christ present. So it's not by faith. This is a joint document, but they're just saying it in terms of what Martin Luther says, so they're planting a seed. It is Christ who gives himself his body and blood to communicate whether or not they believe this. Okay, let's continue. The real presence of Christ. The Fourth Lateran Council used the verb transubstantiare which implies a distinction between substance and accident. Although this was for Luther a possible explanation of what happens in the Lord's Supper, he could not see how this philosophical explanation could be binding for all Christians. In any case, Luther himself strongly emphasized the real presence of Christ in the sacrament. The real, literal presence of Christ in the sacrament. So it's not a symbol, it's a sacrifice. Now let's see how far they will go. Lutheran Roman Catholic Dialogue on the Eucharist, point 153. The question of the reality of the presence of Jesus Christ in the Lord's Supper is not a matter of controversy between Catholics and Lutherans. Now I'm beginning to get weak in my knee. I'm beginning to feel nauseous. The Lutheran Roman Catholic dialogue on the Eucharist was able to state, the Lutheran tradition affirms the Catholic tradition that the consecrated elements do not simply remain bread and wine, but rather by the power of the creative word are given as the body and blood of Christ. Ah, it's like a knife wound. Did you read that? Who capitulated? Protestantism or Romanism? Protestantism, a key doctrine, a key, key, key doctrine. John Rogers, you remember John Rogers? 
John Rogers, the one who picked up the work when they strangled to death and burnt him, John Tyndall, who picked up the word, work that he had not been able to complete and completed the Bible for us so that we can have the Bible in the English tongue. And they grabbed him when they caught him and they put him on the stake. And because he was not an ordained Catholic priest, they could burn him alive and didn't have to strangle him like they did in the case of Tyndall. And they gave him one opportunity. They said to him, transubstantiation. All you have to do is to say that the body and blood is literally present in the Eucharist and you can come down from the stake. You need not die. What did John Rogers do? He stood like a rock and said, set fire to it. I will not do it because by one sacrifice my God has forever made perfect. This is capitulation of the highest order. They tell us to investigate it. Well, we have. In this sense, Lutherans could also occasionally speak, as does the Greek tradition, of a change. Both Catholics and Lutherans have in common a rejection of a spatial or natural manner of presence and a rejection of the understanding of the sacrament as only commemorative or figurative. Complete movement to Roman Catholicism. They've capitulated and given up Protestantism on this issue. So I claim, how sad that Lutherans should agree to this. Common understanding of the real presence of Christ, Article 154. Lutherans and Catholics can together affirm the real presence of Jesus Christ in the Lord's Supper. In the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, Jesus Christ, true God and true man, is present wholly and entirely in his body and blood under the signs of bread and wine. Can you believe that a Lutheran put his pen to that and signed it? My dear brethren, my dear Lutheran friends, are you going to walk over this precipice and give up your Protestant heritage? The common, this common statement affirms all the essential elements of faith in the Eucharistic presence of Jesus Christ without adopting the conceptual terminology of transubstantiation. So what did they do? We don't like the word transubstantiation. We won't use it anymore. That's fine. But what happens is exactly the same, so who cares? That's what they've done. It's brilliant. It's evil. This is evil. That's spoken like a serpent. To the question of the real presence of Jesus Christ in its theological understanding is joined the question of the duration of the presence. Now you must understand what they're talking about. Because in Catholicism you may venerate the host. You may venerate it. You can pick it up, this monstrance with a host in it, and then you can worship it. That is idolatry of the highest order. It is an abomination before God. Now let's read what Lutherans are willing to sign. All right, so the duration. He stays the body and blood according to Catholicism and therefore he's the real body and you can venerate it. And with the question of the adoration of Christ present in the sacrament. That means you can venerate it, you can adore it, you can pray to it. Differences related to the duration of the Eucharistic pres presence appear in the liturgical practice. Catholic and Lutheran Christians together confess that the Eucharistic presence of the Lord Jesus Christ is directed towards the believing reception. That it nevertheless is not confined only to the moment of reception. So in other words, did it be was body and now it's no longer body. You understand what I'm saying? And that it does not depend on the faith of the receiver, how closely related to this might be. Okay, so how long does it stay? The literal body of Christ. And they're saying, it's okay? Are they moving towards venerating the host? This is impossible. This is impossible. With regard to the issue that was the greatest importance for the reformers, the Eucharistic sacrifice. 
You see, Catholicism teaches that the Eucharistic elevation is exactly the same sacrifice as happened on the cross. That means Christ is perpetually sacrificed on a daily basis. It's not biblical. The Catholic-Lutheran dialogue stated, as a basic principle, Catholics and Lutheran Christians together recognize that in the Lord's Supper, that Jesus Christ is present as the crucified who died for our sins and who rose again for our justification. Could you ever have imagined that a Lutheran Protestant organization could put pen to paper and sign something like this, yes or no? This is unbelievable. Unbelievable. My question, how far will you bend, Lutherans? How far will you bend? Let's just study Martin Luther, because the very basis for duping the Lutherans into accepting something like this is what Martin Luther supposedly wrote, right, and said. So let's study what it's all about. So let's go to uh, a normal Christian source, not from my church. What are transubstantiation and what are constant substantiation? Martin Luther changed his view later to consubstantiation because he had a growth in Christian experience, but consubstantiation was also still wrong. And did he later change to the full Protestant view? Yes or no? That is the question. So let's look it up. What is the difference between transubstantiation and consubstantiation? The word transubstantiation derives from the Latin trans, across, and substantia, substance. The term is employed in Roman Catholic theology to denote the idea that during the ceremony of the Mass, the bread and wine are changed in substance into the flesh and blood of Christ, even though the elements appear to remain the same. This doctrine has no basis in Scripture. There are traces of the dogma in some of the post-apostolic writings, and in the concept was vigorously defended in the early 9th century AD. It was adopted at the Fourth Lateran Council in 1215, formalized by the Council of Trent, and was reaffirmed at the Second Vatican Council. Rome never changes. Just a fact. Okay, what did Martin Luther believe initially? Consubstantiation is a term commonly applied to the Lutheran concept of the Communion Supper. Though some modern Lutheran theologians reject the use of the term because of its ambiguity. So modern theologians should all reject it, not just some. But nevertheless, this is what they say. The expression, however, is generally associated with Luther. The idea is that in the communion, the body and blood of Christ and the bread and wine coexist in union with each other. Luther illustrated it by the analogy of the iron put into the fire, where both fire and iron are united in a red-hot iron, and yet each continues unchanged. So, really not much difference between transubstantiation and consubstantiation. And the Protestant world argued with Luther. Zwingli argued with Luther on the issue. And uh, most of the Protestants wouldn't accept it. And his own theologians argued with him and didn't accept it. Martin Luther was... he was... he was clinging to some of the aspects of the Catholic theology. But, ah, what a really Table Talk, Martin Luther. What a magnificent book. And I've referred to it many, many times. This book has such a phenomenal history. Every single Protestant on the planet should read this book. This is the book where his friends and his colleagues wrote down what Martin Luther had to say around the table when he was not constrained by formal circumstances. So what came out of his mouth is what he actually felt and believed. Beautiful. The book was banned on pain of death. Anybody who had the book was sentenced to death by Rome. They dragged the people out murdered them, slaughtered them if they had the book. Eventually they said, if you bring the book and we burn them, then we, they will be free from the sentence. So the books all disappeared. It had been translated even into High Dutch. And there the book was gone. And then 
centuries later, someone was building a house and they dug up the foundations. And in the foundations, wrapped in wax and sealed in wax, they found a Dutch copy of this book. And even then, they were so afraid of the authorities, they smuggled it out to, to England. And there was a gentleman there who was working at the king's court. And he knew both languages, and he was to translate it. And uh, he never got round to it. And one night, he had a dream. You can read it in the cover of the book. One night, he had a dream. And he dreamt that an old man with a white beard said to him, you must translate that book. And he said, yes, oh, he got such a fright, he was going to do it, but forgot about it again and didn't do it. A week later, he was arrested. Nobody gave any charges. He was thrown in jail because the, in his dream, the man said to him, I will give you time to translate it. And there he languished in jail. I forget the exact years, but could be seven years. And he translated the book, and eventually, through circumstances, it uh, ended up with the archbishop, and eventually ended up in the English Parliament. And we spoke about the English Parliament yesterday, which was extremely pro Protestant. And as a consequence of reading this book, the English Parliament didn't really want to be involved, or the Protestants didn't want to translate everything that Luther said because of what he had said about consubstantiation. But listen to what it says in this book. This is now what the Parliament decided. Whereupon they made report, dated the 10th of November, 1646, that they found it to be an excellent divine work worthy of the light and publishing, especially in regard that Luther, in the said discourses, did revoke his opinion, which he formerly held, touching consubstantiation in the sacrament. Whereupon the House of Commons, on the 24th of February, 1646, did give order for the printing thereof. So the reason why they permitted the reprinting of this marvelous book was because Martin Luther had given up consubstantiation. Is this anywhere in this modern report of the Roman Catholic Lutheran dialogue? No, they deny it because it's deceptive. So I want to make sure, Martin Luther, what exactly did you write? This is Martin Luther speaking. Even so, we must let the words of Christ remain and speak of the sacrament in suis terminus in their terms with such words as Christ used and spake. Do this must not be turned into offer this. So the sacrifice is gone. What signifies it to dispute and wrangle about the abominable idolatry of elevating the sacrament on high to show it to the people. What did Martin Luther call that? An abominable idolatry. What does the joint document say? You can do it. Because it's really the body and the blood. So, let's not argue about how long it is there, but it's venerable. Hello? And they're saying that Martin Luther believed this. Yes, he believed it in the beginning. He didn't believe it in the end. So this is deception of the highest order, which has no approbation of the fathers, and was introduced only to confirm the errors touching the worship thereof, as though bread and wine lost their substance and retained only the form, smell, and taste. This the papists called transubstantiation, and darkened the right use of the sacrament. Whereas even in Popedom, at Milan, from Ambrose's time to the present day, they never held or observed in the Mass either canon or elevation of the Dominus Vobiscum, the Lord be with you. So, Martin Luther denied everything that's in that document that they claim he believed. Case closed. So, this is an abominable idolatry. Why is it an abominable idolatry? Because every Roman Catholic Church it's not a church. It's a temple and a cathedral. And a cathedral is a burial place for the dead, where sacrifice is made for the dead and to the dead. And that's why in every Roman Catholic altar there must be a relic of a dead bone, otherwise they cannot tell a mass. It's an 
an abomination. You shall not consult with the dead, nor will you sacrifice to the dead. It's an abomination to God. This is a typical Roman Catholic altar. Look how it is made out of hewn marble. You go up the stairs. Exodus chapter 20 verse 26, Neither shalt thou go up the steps unto mine altar, that thy nakedness be not discovered thereon. No steps were to go up to an altar. All Roman Catholic altars have steps. Deuteronomy, Thou shalt build the altar of the Lord thy God of whole stones, and thou shalt offer burnt offerings thereon unto the Lord thy God. It had to be whole, unhewn stones. Why? Because they represent the character of Christ, and the character of Christ cannot be hewn and squared because it's perfect. But the bricks that went into the temple, they had to be hewn and squared because they represent you and me, the people, who are hewn and squared in the quarry of this life and then built into the temple by representing living stones. So this is an altar as it was. Here is one of hewn stones. According to God, this one is an abomination because it does not reflect the righteousness of Christ. Isaiah 65 verse 3, A people that provoke me to anger continually to my face, that sacrifices in gardens and burnt incense upon altars of brick. You're not allowed to build them like that. Catholicism violates every principle of the Bible. It is not. A Christian religion. Martin Luther said this elevation of the host, as you see the Pope doing here, is an abomination. It's an abomination. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Here we see the Pope washing the feet, and even kissing the feet. And I've seen these pictures even in our own ranks testifying to the humility of the Pope as he washes the feet of the destitute and the sick and the marginalized. What a wonderful man. I want to tell you today, brothers and sisters, this is an abomination. And I'll tell you why. Ye call me Master and Lord, and ye say, Well, for so I am. If then if I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. When Jesus washed the disciples' feet, did they in turn wash his feet, yes or no? No. Why not? Why not? He was sinless. He was the sinless, spotless Son of God. You cannot wash accumulated sins of the Son of God. He's perfect. But when it comes to the disciples, you have to wash one another's feet. The Pope washes other people's feet, but he doesn't allow them to wash his feet. What is he saying thereby? What's he doing? is taking the place of Jesus Christ. And this is an abomination because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I want to tell you today, if one of your pastors, which includes myself, should ever come to you and say, today is washing of feet and I will wash all your feet and then I go and stand on the front, throw me out. It's an abomination. I'm a sinner like everyone else and I need my feet washed like everyone else. Nobody is to elevate himself beyond anyone else. It's an abomination. Ministry. Luther's understanding of the common priesthood of the baptized and the ordained office in the New Testament, the word hereos, priest, Latin, sacredos, did not designate an office in the Christian congregation, even though Paul describes his apostolic ministry as that of a priest. Romans 15, 16. Now, the way they distort this is absolutely amazing. Priest, as in Hebrew 9, verse 6, where the word is hereos, which means a priest. Now, what does that 
word mean? I would like to know what it means. A priest, one who offers sacrifices. Are you with me? So a priest is someone who offers sacrifices. So the Old Testament, they were priests because they offered sacrifices. They typified the death of the Son of God. But if Jesus died for me, and he is the perfect sacrifice, then I can only become a witness to that sacrifice, but I can no longer take the title of priest. But Roman Catholicism takes the title of priest, pa not pastors, as in the case of Protestantism. Well, let's, let's look at this in a little bit of detail, because it gets fascinating. So there's a metaphorical use of the word priest, like you find in 1 Peter 2 verse 9, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, there is the word, as though you are a sacrificial priest, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So here is a metaphorical way of using priesthood, but it doesn't describe the office of someone who is priesthood. It's a general term. But they quote Romans 15, 16 in their document, where the Greek word is not this one that is used here for priesthood, but liturgos, which means a minister, which means from a derivative, a public servant, a functionary in the temple. So you're ministering the gospel. So let's compare the King James with the NIV regarding this interesting little word in Romans 15, 16. Leiturgos. Romans 15, 16. King James Version. That I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. Ministering the gospel of God. That the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. So Paul considered himself as a minister of the word. One who disseminates the word. He was not the sacrificial priest. What does the NIV do with the same terminology? To be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles, he gave me the priestly duty of proclaiming the gospel of God. You see how the, the modern translation distorts that? I've never been a friend of the modern translation, so I receive a lot of flack with, for that, but I'm not a friend of the modern translations for reasons more numerous than I can mention. One of them is this one. They claim Christ is the high priest. True. Luther understands the relationship of believers to Christ as joyful exchange in which the believer takes part in the prophet properties of Christ and thus also in his priesthood. Then he goes, they go on to say, hence all of us who believe in Christ are priests. Now that's very strange. Even though the Luther's understanding all Christians are priests, he does not regard them all as ministers. It is true that all Christians are priests, but not all are pastors. For to be a pastor, one must not only be a Christian and a priest, but must have an office and a field of work committed to him. So they write this jarbled sentence to confuse the mind, but eventually they come to the point. They want to be a priesthood, and Protestants are not a priesthood. How are they going to get these two together? This call and command makes pastors and preachers. Within this framework, the council developed the notion of the priesthood of baptized and addressed its relationship to the ministerial priesthood. In Catholic theology, this is this document, the ordained ministers sacramentally empowered to act in the name of Christ as well as in the name of the church. Okay, now what does that mean? In Catholic theology, a sacrament is something that leads to salvation, merely by performing the act. Are you with me? So if I go to the sacrament of penance, I go and confess my sins, that leads to my salvation. If I partake in the sacrament of the Mass, that leads to my salvation. In Protestant theology, Nothing that I do of any ritualistic nature, no matter how elevated, can lead to my salvation. It's a personal relationship between God and me. Now let's continue this. 
Catholic theology is convinced that the office of bishop makes an indispensable contribution to the unity of the church. So we want this hierarchy. Catholics raise the question of how, without the episcopal office, church unity can be maintained in times of conflict. You need a pope. You need a bishop. You need someone who tells you what to do. You can't rely on your conscience. You need a boss. So where's the relationship with Christ directly? So this is Catholic thinking. They've also been concerned, this is their document, that Luther's particular doctrine of the common priesthood did not adequately maintain the church's hierarchical structure, which are seen as divinely instituted. So God instituted the structure of the hierarchy, which is the magisterium, the pope and the cardinals and the bishops. That's divinely instituted, according to Catholic theology. And therefore, you have to be ordained to the priesthood to be empowered to bring the sacrifice which brings salvation. My question is, Really? Was it divinely instituted? Or was it instituted by the church fathers? Lutherans and Catholics also agree on the responsibility of ordained leadership for the administration of the sacraments. Lutherans say the gospel bestows on those who preside over the churches the commission. I'm going to read this again. Are you awake? Just shake your heads, please. Wake up. You've got to hear this. Are you awake? Good, let's read it again. Lutherans and Catholics agree on the responsibility of ordained leadership for the administration of the sacraments. Lutherans say, the gospel bestows on those who preside over the churches the commission to proclaim the gospel, forgive sins, and administer the sacraments. I hope you will all have an apoplectic fit at this very moment. This must be the greatest affront to Jesus Christ and his ministry that Lutherans have ever, ever handed up and put to paper. Didn't they separate and say that the only one who can forgive sins is Jesus Christ? What is this doing in this document? Who's changed? Has Rome changed or have the Lutherans changed? Now, my Lutheran brethren, what do you do if your church goes along in 2017 with this proclamation as it stands thus far? We're not done yet. What are you going to do? Are you going to go along with it? If you go along with it, then you condone it. If you condone it, then you are responsible before God. For what? You are condoned. Catholics also declare that the priests are commissioned to administer the sacraments which they consider to be bound up with the Eucharist and direct towards it as etc. etc. However, the Bible and the spirit of prophecy tell you something totally different. It says, though the ministration was to remove from the earthly to the heavenly temple, we read in this great book, The Desire of Ages. Though the sanctuary in our great high priest would be invisible to human sight, yet the disciples would to suffer no loss thereby. They would realize no break in their communion and no diminution of the power because of the Savior's absence. While Jesus ministers in the sanctuary above, he's still by his spirit the minister of the church on earth. He doesn't need an intermediary. He's still here. He's with us today. And Hebrews 9, 12 and Hebrews 10, 12 say, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy temple, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Once. But this man, after he offered one sacrifice for sins, forever sat down at the right hand of God. There is no such thing as a constant sacrifice. It's an abomination. It's a denial of Jesus Christ. Now, where did they get this idea that the hierarchy in the church was divinely instituted. Well, it doesn't stand in the Bible. So let's have a look at it. 
It all happened in the first two and a half centuries after Christ, after the disciples passed away. Ignatius of Antioch. In his letters we encounter for the first time an ecclesiology which exalts one bishop over the rest of the presbytery. So here's the first man, the first church father, and says, no, there's one boss man. One boss man. Next comes Irenaeus. He introduces virtual infallibility. Rome bases apostolic succession on Irenaeus. So here is infallibility. And he also developed the basis for Catholic Marian theology. It's not in the Bible. It comes from the church fathers. Then there's Tertullian. He develops clarification. The distinction between clergy and laity. In the New Testament, the Greek word kleros can mean, you know, casting lots or whatever. But for the first time, you have a difference between hierarchical structures in the church. Now let's just go to Acts 15, 23. And again, I want to compare the King James with the NIV. Most people know this, but I want my Lutheran brethren and my Methodist brethren and my Baptist brethren out there to see what's going on in the world. Because all of them are going towards Rome. The Methodists have also signed the Joint Declaration on Justification, and the Baptists are now asking for reunification with Rome. They've actually gone to see the Pope. So we're all in the same boat here. Acts 15, 23. And they, the Apostles, wrote letters by them after this manner. The Apostles, the Elders, and the Brethren sent greetings unto the Brethren, which are of the Gentiles in Antioch, Syria, and Sicilia. So here was a council, a decision-making body in the church, deciding what shall be done. And the council consisted of the Apostles, the Elders, and the brethren. All of them were part of the decision-making capacity. Not so in Rome. What does the NIV do? But then they sent the following letters. The apostles and elders, comma, your brothers, making it the apostles and elders to the Gentile believers in Antioch. So here you have a hierarchy. So the new translation perverts the word of God and creates a hierarchy that doesn't exist in the early church and should never exist in the last church either. And then comes Cyprian and he elevates the clerics to the priests. Cyprian claimed that the bishop is a sacrificing priest. Both Jews and Gentiles were familiar with the idea of priests and sacrifices, but Cyprian was the first to relate this new religion, Christianity, with the older one in this way. So the earlier doctrine of the priesthood of all believers began to be abandoned and slipped into the background, almost into oblivion. In Cyprian is found the gem of the division of the sacrament into two, the Eucharist and the sacraments of thanksgiving. The Mass, a new development, and now the bishop became a sacrificing priest, and the bloodless but real sacrifice that he offered was the Passion of our Lord. So this is how it came into the Church, and now in this joint document, they have capitulated on this matter and have affirmed that the priest, that he can take part of the sacrament, which is what they are doing there when they do the transubstantiation, and that he can forgive sins, and all those issues related to priesthood. May the Lord help us as we continue to study this document. Now I'm going to break it here and we'll continue the document and then we'll, we'll see in the next episode how this relates to the typology of the Bible in terms of the plan of salvation and where we're standing in the stream of time. And I think we will find that this is a thunderous event happening in the Christian world. It is pivotal to our understanding of prophecy. And we are on the very edge of the final events predicted in the Bible. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, it is with sadness that we see a joint document between Protestants and Catholics 
which negates thus far every single principle that Protestantism stood for, capitulates and marginalizes our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Please help the Protestant world to wake up to the danger in which they find themselves and to accept responsibility on a personal level if the corporate body rejects. Help them to understand the issues and help us to understand the issues too. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen.